Putting on my top hat, tying up my white tie, brushing up my tail. Welcome to Hatcast, the podcast about hats. I'm Charles Berman. And I'm Carl Bernhardson. And we're here to talk about hats. And we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. Yes. Now, actually, before we begin with anything to do with this week's hat, we have old business. Old business? Yes. We've had commentary on our previous installment. Oh, yeah. We always we, we always we, ask for it, and yeah, we finally got we it. We have finally got commentary. A, a listener said, sent a picture of herself wearing bucket hats. Okay. And said, at Hatcast, and there, uh, should we, uh, do, what, what can we say about bad language on the program? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll imply that it's there, but we won't say it. Yes. Uh, on bucket hats. They're defecating on bucket hats. Different which word. we haven't done. Right. Uh, but we're trying to keep this family friendly. Uh, if you have a friendly family, you can join them to listen to this program. Uh, and then she said, they've become teen slash festival culture chic. Huh. See, we weren't aware of that, being neither uh, teens nor festival goers. No, and I think that brings up a point. This is an entirely, a podcast of entirely our own individual opinions. Yes, and we happen to be two somewhat effete uh, (laughs) uh, hat enthusiasts. So I, I for one, can at least say I'm not up with the uh, hip youth culture and how that uh, interacts with the world of hats. Uh, And you know what? That's what's going to shape... The up That's and coming fine. hat. Nobody is involved in every element of human culture at once. Right. No one can be. But we're open to we we look for other views on the hats that we discuss, and we're open to other people bringing us information about these hats. I didn't know they were festival culture chic. I wore one as a teenager. Okay, the bucket hat. But I, ha- I haven't been one for several years. No, I was only briefly a teenager. Yeah, I I mean you're a teenager for for less time than you're in your twenties, thirties, forties, fifties. Uh, and especially if you die during one of those decades. Right. Um, so thank you for the feedback. We always welcome feedback about any of the hats we discuss or more views on the cultural associations of hats, because I think, as we mentioned before, any hat has two elements of its aesthetic appeal. It has both its simple visual appearance and it has cultural associations. Right. And we're here to figure out both of those. Yeah. Now, let's get into the hats of the day. We always mention our hats of the day. What what hat are you wearing today? Uh, today, I was wearing uh, just a simple baseball cap when I went to the store. Um, I'm Very inside good. now, obviously not wearing a hat. But That's good store-going apparel, yeah. yeah. It, uh, it has, I think it says... Uh, Shakespeare Festival 2003 on it. Oh, very so, good. Yeah. I also have a Shakespeare-related baseball cap uh, from the Ontario Shakespeare Festival. Okay. I actually don't know which Shakespeare Festival it is. They didn't bother to print that on the cap. Yeah, they have one in Stratford, Ontario. And the Shakespeare Festival there is brilliant, and it's only there because the town is also called Stratford. Oh, okay. Uh, and it's also next to a town called Shakespeare, which I don't know if this was... It sounds very intentional. Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, in upstate New York, all of the towns named after classical or biblical towns. Yeah. You know, it was it was one person's intentional uh, doing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nabokov uh, has some books set in Ilion, New York, which is not a real place, but it's very evocative of the kinds of places that you'll find in upstate New York. Um, my hat of the day is the one I mentioned in a previous episode. It's this brownish gray tweed bucket shaped hat that I don't think you would call a bucket hat. No. But it's it's it is crushed at the front. It is crushed at the front. It's crushable. It's shapeable. It's easily packable. It's comfortable. It's coarse, but that doesn't imp- impugn it. I think, and it, you know, handcrafted exclusively by David Hanna and Sons Limited, Donegal Town, Ireland, pure new wool. Oh. No, this is a very it is a homely hat that I'm. I've seen you I'm wear it many many yes. times yes. when walking. Um, and you walked over here wearing it. I did, and yeah. was not accosted by anyone saying, what a shocking bad hat. <laughs> but enough about that. The hat of the day is one that I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's called, well, it's called many things. The name of it is the Ushanka, which is a Russian word. Right. And now we should point out that Charles does speak Russian. Yes. So if you encounter people, I, I've, as a second language, so if you encounter people talking about this hat... They sometimes just call it a Russian hat. Right. There are many kinds of Russian hats. Yeah, I know when I first became interested in it in my youth, I Google searched Russian hat. Uh-huh. Uh, and I was 
That that's what I was looking for. I was looking for the Ushan cut. Right. And there are now. I have a baseball cap with a Russian flag on it. That is, you could call that's that a, a Russian, Russian hat. hat. Yep. But so the, the more specifically, you would call it an Ushanka. Or if you're speaking in Russian, you call it a Shapka Ushanka, which means a Ushanka hat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, in form, well, well, in etymology, that simply comes from the fact that the Russian word for an ear is ucha. The word for ears is ushi. Okay. And it is called a word relating to ear, not because it helps you hear better. But because it covers your ears and keeps them from being cold. Yes. And okay. So it's so an ear hat, essentially. It is an ear hat. Now, it's not any hat that covers your ears, but it, it does encompass several varieties of hat that cover the human ear. And as I, what, actually, what I mentioned earlier is, is actually something of a downfall of the hat, because it can make you hear a little bit worse. Right. So if you are out in the tundra hunting, and you don't want to be attacked by surprise by a wolf... You might want to be extra vigilant while wearing this hat, because it can cause your auditory perception to be lowered. But it will also prevent your ears from becoming so incredibly cold that they you know, fall Get off. frostbite, right. or cause you discomfort, yeah. which can be one of the worst side effects of cold. I'm holding one now, and this is, um, this is of the brown, furry style variety. Right. Now, a lot of uh, them are made of fur or faux fur. Is that a necessity? Uh, it is not a necessity. So what you'll find, if you looked it up, it says here, um, they're often made from inexpensive sheepskin, rabbit, or muskrat fur. I've read of them being made of seal skin. Okay. Often, they, those are very, very, uh, expensive materials, so you could get a very nice ushanka made out of those materials. This one, if I look inside it, at what it is made of... I assume it's faux fur. Yes. This one, the fur is 57% acrylic, 43% polyester, and the uh, fill, the lining is 100% polyester. So, for those of you unaware, there's no animal called the polyester. <laughs> right, you don't, you don't have to use something that's made of an animal product in order to wear it. No, but one thing to mention is that if you are an animal rights advocate, you might be upset by the proliferation of fur ushanki. Which, there are many. There are. It is It is traditional to make it out of fur. And the reason is simple. Fur is warm. Yep. It will uh, keep it, your yeah, head it, warm it and will, keep your ears warm. Yeah. Now, the tr you, you might hear of them being made out of uh, what's called, uh, in Russian, rybi miech, which is fish fur. Fish don't have fur. Fish don't have fur. What they mean by that is it's sort of an expression just like naga hide. The naga does not have a hide. Right. It, it it basically means they're false fur. It traces back to the Russian proverb, a poor man's fur coat is of fish fur. Ubinyaka shuba na roibium miehu. Actually, I, I might have got the emphasis wrong on that, because it's a second language. This is a guy here wearing one, and it's a different... You can see uh, Wikipedia shows us this guy with a, a different texture right. of false fur than mine. And you'll often see this hat, especially when it's on military types, with the ears folded up to make a sort of a square appearance. Okay. Yeah, and it seems, uh, in this photograph we're looking at now, the ears are folded up and then even farther up across the top. And it does yeah. give it a very square look. Yeah, which is probably more appropriate for a military type of person. Right. And now, so this is uh, fish fur. Um, it seems, refers specifically to, or more specifically, to faux fur that's made of wool that's then made to look like some other animal's fur. Right. Okay. Which mine is is entirely synthetic polyester. And it looks out mine I think is really a hat for practical purposes with a little bit of flair, right. I imagine. Cuz this is a hat you would only wear when it is very very cold and probably also windy. Now a question, yeah, that I've always had about the Ushanka. Yes. Um it has the two flaps on the side. It does. And a sort of flappish part on the back. Um, those f fold down to keep yeah, you warm. Yeah. There's also a flap on the front. There is, yes. If you were to pull that down, y you would lose all vision. Yes. Uh, and it doesn't ever seem to be able to be pulled down. Is it just there for symmetry? Or... This might remain an open question, actually. In my version here, and in any of the ones I've seen, it is sewn up. Right. You cannot pull it down. Now, I've read books because I have eccentric reading habits. 
<laughs> of <laughs> travels of people exploring the Siberian wilderness, where it can get extremely cold. And if you're out there in the winter when it's negative 40 for long periods of time, you wouldn't want even your eyes to be exposed for a long time to that cold. Okay. Um, so they would, that front flap would be functional and they would just hide their face and hunker down and wait for it to be a little bit warmer. Yeah, I think maybe, and this is me speculating, if you're in Vyrkhayansk and it's negative 40 and you're outside, you want to be able to see where you're going, but you're also, if you're going to be outside for any longer, you might want to even cover your eyes, which is, we'll get to, I think, the balaclava eventually. Right. Which, that might be, incur some debate about whether that's a hat. You put it on your head. Yeah. <laughs> but no, is it a hat? That'll be a fun episode. Yeah. Um, but this, the, the Ushanka is, it's extremely warm. You would not want to wear it when it's only brisk. Your head will get too hot very quickly. <laughs> You, and you can see, actually, there's some made of leather, too, with, with fur lining and flaps. Right. Uh, and they're actually, it it's crosses over somewhat. It, it, there's a liminal space between the Ushanka and what I guess you would call a hunter's hat. Right. Hunter's hat would typically have a brim, right? That's the I think the, normally, the... although, yeah. So if you look at, here's one with a very brightly patterned um, shell and then fur lining. You would see, you've seen many people, I think, during the winter wearing those in the wild. It, yeah, it's pretty common. Uh, so the, the Ushanka, I think I would say, and I would call that Ushanka, it's a brightly patterned Ushanka, not in an unpleasant way, but I think it's a pretty popular, for both men and women, kind of hat in the area we inhabit right now. Yes, and especially this time of year. Yeah. Now, we're looking at one here that I have seen in the wild myself, and it is an Ushanka that has extra flaps that let you lift them up so you can hear. Oh, yes, I've seen that, and I like that. Mine is more of a, the one that I'm holding here is it's very more traditional. of a tra rustic style Ushanka. Yeah. Uh, although it does have one thing that's another bonus about an Ushanka is it has this this leather strap and buckle. So you can, if you just want to leave your ears open, if it's not that cold, which then I don't know why you're wearing an Ushanka, but if it's not that cold, you can buckle the ears up on top of your head. Right. If it is very cold, you can let them fall down, and if it's even colder, you can buckle the ears under your chin so that they stay close to your face and don't even let that bit of cold air reach the outside of your ear. Okay. Um, that my particular one, because it's all covered in faux fur, I don't think it. I think it looks like a hat when you put it on, and I'll put it on so that only Carl can see me. But I think if you look at me outside wearing this, it sometimes looked like I had just have a mane of crazy hair all over my head. <laughs> this is true. Uh, I, it, do, it does lend no. to the... At a distance, I, I could look at you and think, my goodness, Charles needs a haircut. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, um, this is not true of some of the cheaper... They do make cheaper ones that are not covered in the fur, that are... I guess you could call them a cooler Ushanka. And those are, the, in this area, they have the advantage of being inexpensive and also the advantage of being suitable to. Our climate gets very cold. But not that cold, right? Yeah. And we're not hitting negative 40. Um. And I, and actually a couple of years ago, we had an extremely cold winter, even colder than the current winter, which for you listeners out there who might not be where we are, when we are, is very cold. But during that winter, it was extremely cold. It was negative 14 or so, and I was outside wearing gloves, reading a book about how it was negative 40 in Siberia, and I was just, it was an interesting book, so I was happy, and I was just thinking how lucky I was that it was so warm that it was negative 14. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking Fahrenheit, because we're in the United States, and that's the the ter term the term that's going here, so if, but that you do your own conversions yeah. if you're... <laughs> Probably you have access to Google if you have access to podcasts. I would hope. <laughs> unless unless uh, you're on the special subscription plan where we put the podcast onto a compact disc and mail it to you. That's available for that is a available. charge, yes. Yeah, if you want that, we will do it. Yeah. So now you said you had an interest in Ushanki at a certain point. I did. Well, I was... I was um, what did it? Oh, I know. Uh, the Hunt for Red October. Uh -huh. has always been a favorite movie of mine. 
I read the novel. The novel isn't as good as the movie. We don't have to get into that. I haven't either read it or seen it. Tom Clancy is not, you know, my favorite author. He doesn't have a reputation as a great prose stylist. Right. Uh, Good plots. Uh Uh-huh. You know, interesting events occurred. Uh, But yeah, no, not not stylistically great. Uh, But that's fine when you're turning it into a movie. And the style is now pictures and Sean Connery, who is a wonderful actor. And I'll say, as an aside here... People say, people will say, oh, I saw this movie. It was based on a book. The, the book was much better than the movie. And I believe them. In many cases, that's true. And then usually when that happens, someone else in the room, if a conversation is happening, will say, wow, the book's always better than the movie. The trouble with that statement is it's patently false. Right, it's not true. No. We don't have to, th- let's not get too far down this road. Oh, no, movie. yes. Yeah. But, yeah, um, movie better than book. Movie being... Hunt for Red October, uh, that's what got me interested in sort of the Soviets. Um, mm-hmm. And then, oh, there was a library sale when I was in middle school. Uh, and they were getting rid of some old books. And one of them was, oh, what was the title? I think it was uh, uh, the Soviet Life in the Soviet Union in Pictures. Oh, interesting. And it was fantastic. And I remember just flipping through it and seeing these pictures of very sad young girls with violins sort of staring at the camera and these men outside in the snow <laughs> with these huge fur hats um, and me thinking, what is that hat and how do I get it? Yeah. Uh, and then I, you know, I, I, I always enjoyed um, music from the what, the Red Army choir. Yeah. So uh, that's that's what led me into trying to find and acquire one of these hats. And, and I did. And you did. And, and you I have did. it still. And how, do you wear it frequently? What would... What what are your thoughts as a practical wearer of the Ushanka? In the winter, I used to wear it uh, all the time. I don't have it here. Uh, uh-huh. It didn't make it to this apartment. In fact, I need to locate it. But yeah, I did. I did go out of my way to get one, and uh, I think I would like another. Uh, I do think they also um, look very nice with any kind of um, metal badge or pin uh, at the front of them. I don't know that I would wander around with uh, you know CCCP and the sickle and hammer. That's on a star, uh, yeah. But... <laughs> that's a little bit uh, overtly political of a statement yeah. to wear on a hat. I... But it does, you know, it it, it uh, does seem sort of uniquely, yeah, uh, open to that kind of thing. Yeah. Now it says if you look up the history, and it says hats with ear flaps have been known in Russia, Ukraine, Serbia, Slovenia, Croatia, Macedonia, Bulgaria, and Germany. You could list some more countries too in Germany <laughs> for centuries. The modern standard ushanka with a perfectly round crown was developed in the twentieth century. Uh, and it talks about the Russian Civil War, and it refers to W.C. Fields wearing it in the very funny 1930s short film, The Fatal Glass of Beer, which I don't know if you've seen. I haven't. W.C. Fields is a fantastic character in the history of entertainment and comedy, and also a popularizer of what I think is a very good hat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you brought up a point, which is that the Ushanka, if you look at images of it, and if you remember ones you've seen... So we have, this is sort of a bifurcating hat, and we have this sort of standard one where you might have a gray or plaid shell with some fake fur around it. You can buy that at a gas station. Many people wear it, and I think it's a solid purchase, especially in a cold winter when it's snowy. Uh, and you also have some these sort of perfectly round crown kind of ushankas. Those are often worn by members of the army in especially Russia and other po- post-Soviet states. And you also have hats that are an imitation of that. You will also, you'll often see people buy those on the internet from the former Soviet Union. You'll see them come back with them if they've gone to visit the former Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. They will usually be gray, and they will usually have a pin on the front. Sometimes it'll just be a star. Sometimes it'll be the modern Russian... Federation m- symbol? Yeah, this double eagle crest of the Russian Federation. And sometimes it will be a hammer and sickle. And I've seen people wearing those around. You you said you wouldn't wear that. I think it's a little bit perhaps gauche. I don't know. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, um, what, I mean, are you really making a statement? No. Does it look cool? Absolutely. Of yeah. course. I mean, that's, uh, most military uniforms are designed to look good. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, even, even something practical like a winter hat. Oh, yeah. Um, I have, um, not, uh, Ushanka from uh, that's post Soviet uh, or old Soviet stock, but I do have a uh, Soviet pilot's hat 
Um, oh, really? Yes, here uh, in the house. Um, and we'll, when we talk about like peaked military caps at some point, I'll pull that oh, out. Oh, all right. And, uh, oh, I see what you mean. I thought yeah. you meant the sort of skull cap leather goggles he pilots No, hat, no, which, sort uh, of the pilot's uniform. Yeah. Right, which both of those are hats that, oh, yes, I see it now. <laughs> it, it, those of you in the audience, I, I'm aware this is an audio production, so you can't, but... Uh, imagine yourself seeing it and, and imagine looking up and seeing it on top of a shelf uh, <laughs> that's, that's what's just happened that's what we're experiencing just now yeah so we'll do episodes on both of those kinds of hat but no i think that and we're not going to get into really the politics implied by hats and their rightness or wrongness in this program no no point in that but i think there is a certain amount of gaucheness in advertising your politics on the front of your hat any hat yes it's it's pretty direct. It is, yeah. And I also there is a person I know who's a, a a fantastic person, a friend of mine who I like very much, who has a hat like this with the hammer and sickle on it, and wears it around. And I do not think he is a communist. No, well, he may just enjoy, yeah, the look of the hat, right? right? Which is an interesting, it's an interesting territory to get into, right? Wearing a hat that has associations that might not be true about yourself. Um, because, like language, people use the semiotics of hats to make statements about themselves. And you can get into the weeds if you're not aware of that Right when you wear hats. The hammer and sickle hat that he wears, I think, is entirely, from his perspective, a fashion item. Mm -hmm. Now, is it an actual... Was it old Soviet stock that he bought up cheap at some point? No, or? he bought the hat at Target okay. and acquired the pin somewhere else because okay. he thought it looked right with the hat. Target, I think, is not the sort of <laughs> establishment that would be approved of by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, unless, I, you, unless you're in Transnistria. <laughs> this is yeah. not... Well, I mean... It is still a, 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 a symbol that means something. Mm -hmm. The second most powerful party in the Russian Federation today is the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, right. which is the successor of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And if you were to walk around the streets of any city in Russia wearing this hat with a hammer and sickle on it, people would probably think you were supporting the Communist Party or, and I would say probably were in some kind of one of their rallies or something. Right. Why, why else do you wear the symbol around? Either that or you are a tourist who have just bought a kitschy hat. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. It could, it could either be overtly political or just very kitschy. Right. But I think if you're wearing it just as a kitsch item, you can get into the weeds. Right. So that's a warning. If you wear a political symbol, it can be taken as a political symbol. Right. And like we said, the... the um... The badge at the front of the cap is not an essential part. No, it's of the not. You, you, ha you don't. It doesn't and otherwise, it's a very practical hat. Yeah, and I think there are some with just a red star, but that is also a symbol of socialism and communism, which you can wear at your own risk. Right. Yeah. I, I think some people might be trying to use that as a less overt ushanka pin, but it it isn't necessarily right. Well, let's start to rate this. Okay. I like it a lot. <laughs> I do, too. Uh, there's my objective view. Uh, I'm going to give this pretty high ratings in both. It's not a perfect hat. But it, it actually, in certain circumstances, it is. It's Well, yeah, there are certain circumstances it is exactly the hat that you need. It is, in fact, essential for your survival. Yeah. Uh, if you are going to be vacationing in Verkhoyansk in the wintertime, you're going to need to keep your head warm. One layer of knitted wool is not going to do it for you. You're going to have some permutation of an Ushanka on your head. Or you should. Or you should be indoors the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> One or the other. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I think this is... Part, and, and this includes... Now, I'll, I'll uh, convey to you that in this area... It was negative 15 or so Fahrenheit a week or two ago. Right. Didn't it get to... Yeah. Uh, I think it was negative 10, somewhere in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And on a day like that, the Ushanka is a perfectly apposite hat. Absolutely. And my got, mine got some good wear on right. those days. And that's true. And uh, it's interesting to think, this is our first very seasonal hat that we've gotten into. Yeah. Uh, how do we... I mean, 
Because it's oh no, practic- it isn't. The bucket hat's pretty seasonal. Oh, it's pretty seasonal, isn't it? But go ahead. How, how do we, uh, on this second seasonal hat uh, that we're discussing, how do we um, sort of include seasonality into the rating, right? Because it's useless in July, right? You Oh, you're right. If, if it's July it's and you're wearing this hat, you have gone to the Arctic, yeah. or <laughs> you work in a cooler, or some other strange circumstance, or you would not just wear it in the... The heat of a New York July. We're in New York. Uh, now, but so, I think we, we should give people the benefit of the doubt. That they're wearing it at the right time of year. That people will wear it in the appropriate, generally appropriate circumstances. Right. Now, that said, again, and we'll use it as an example. If we're doing propeller beanie, when are the appropriate circumstances? A children's <laughs> birthday party. <laughs> yes. There's, there almost are none. So, <laughs> I think we have to take into account... Are there a reasonable amount of appropriate right. circumstances? This, this hat has a purpose, and that purpose can be fulfilled in a specific set of circumstances that you are likely to encounter in certain parts of the yes. world. Yes, yes. And I would say cold weather is not an uncommon circumstance. Right. You could be in Alaska. You could be in the Yukon. You could be in uh, the uh, in Vladivostok. You could be in other uh, Finland. You Correct. could be in Norway. Many places in the world have cold weather and you need a hat like this. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't be telling you this, <laughs> but there is a Norwegian saying. Oh, no, no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. Yes. Yep. And if we use the broad definition of clothing to encompass hats. I think hats are clothes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Some people don't consider it so. And we could probably do an episode on that. Yeah. Um. The, the permutations are endless, but I I agree with that, and I think the appositeness of it for the weather is something we can assume people will do mm-hmm. and factor in. If someone wants to come to us and say, "Will you rate my wearing of an Ushanka in a heat wave in July?" <laughs> and I was very uncomfortable. <laughs> right, then I'll I'll rate that at zero. Yeah, you've, yeah, you've, yeah. you've done it yes. wrong. You've made a poor choice. Uh, I mean, maybe you were playing the part of a commissar, <laughs> and you were walking to rehearsal, and your hands were full, and you didn't have a place to carry the hat. All right, I understand why you did it, but it still gets a low rating. It's not practical. <laughs> so, um, as far as our ratings, yes, um, it's been a couple of weeks since we've done an episode. It has. How do we? What was our scale? Well, we <laughs> it's it's one to ten. One to ten. Okay. I, if I recall correctly. On practicality. And style. And style. Okay. Just also to remind, you may be a first-time uh, listener. Well, this is, we're early days here. This is our third episode. Yeah. And maybe you're listening to this years later, catching up to our episodes that we're now doing about who knows what hat. Well, we're when we're sort of international hat, hat celebrities. Hat stars, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, all right. Where would you rate this on a style rating? Zero being extremely unstylish. Right. Uh, nine. Absolutely a nine. A nine? Yeah. I'd say it's about as stylish as it can get in the winter. You know, I may even, on style, I'm going to do it. I'm going to give it, well, that's so dangerous to give out tens. Okay. You I, can do it. I, I, you know, I've given a ten already. I'm, I, I'm so afraid. I, I just love it. I love this hat. Um, and I think it doesn't, it looks good on everybody. Man, yes, woman, child. Yes, yeah. Um... Yeah, I, okay, 10. I'm giving it a 10 on style. All right. It just is stylish. I'm going uh, to... I, I really agree with you. I'm going to give it a 9, just because there are a couple slight knocks. Uh, I think the furrier variety can sometimes be... look like crazy hair. <laughs> yes. And I think the... <clears throat> and I think sometimes the... The cheaper variety can worn with incongruous clothes, and even when it's cold, it sometimes just looks a little incongruous. This is nitpicking, but I'm going to give it a nine instead. Right. Uh, but I, I'm really at heart in agreement with you. Yeah. Of of the hats that you can wear in the winter, it's one of the more formal hats. Yeah. But you can also wear it with most informal clothing. Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a you can wear it with most informal clothing, but there there's a picture with uh here, here's a picture. This is uh, Gerald Ford and Leonid Brezhnev, both wearing, both wearing Ushanka. Ushankas in their uh, very formal clothes. Uh, Gerald Ford has a little bit of a loud tie for a sitting president, <laughs> I, but that's all right. Um, and it looks perfectly good. Now, actually, you know what? No, they're not both wearing Ushankas. 
That's true. Ford is wearing a new shotgun. Ford is wearing a new shotgun, but he looks good with it. It's a good choice for his outfit, which has a a tie and a uh, overcoat, right? For the cold weather, and it looks good with most outfits, formal or informal. And the reason for that is, here's another. Here's Helmut Schmidt wearing one. Yeah, the reason for that is, if you're wearing a Nushanka, it's cold. So, the rest of you has got to be covered and warm. Right. If you are wearing very casual clothes underneath, like a t-shirt and jeans. Even if you've thrown an overcoat over it. The overcoat high hides that. Now, what's the most non... What's the most casual warm weather covering you could wear? Probably one of those puffy ski jackets. A cold weather covering, you mean? Yes, that's what yeah. I meant. Puffy ski jacket, something loud, made of synthetic material. Yeah, that's informal, but... Still not, it's not like showing up to um, work at an office in a t-shirt, you know? Yeah, it's, it it's still, no one's yeah, going to be fine. offended that you wore a ski jacket. Uh, yeah, so you could wear this Ushanka with a very stylish, thick wool overcoat and an expensive scarf. Or you could wear it with a puffy ski jacket. I think even the puffy ski jacket doesn't get so low a level of formality that it's incongruous. So it goes with almost anything. Yeah. Let's go to practicality value. Okay. I think that it gets a nine on practicality. I I, think I'm going to agree with you. The only thing, the only detractor is that it makes it harder to hear. It does um, make it harder to hear, yeah. And that in, it's not for all types of cold weather. Like no. mildly, mild winters, it's not, not perfect. Um, but for the purposes that it needs to serve, it's, it's a nine. Yeah. Absolutely. So nine plus nine plus nine plus ten. Divided by four. This gets a nine and a quarter. Wow. What a score. High ranking. I'm going to have to say, I think this is, I don't remember exactly, but I think this is higher than our bowler ranking. Bowler, I think bowler got nine. We'll have to yeah. go back and look. But this but. is very impressive. I congratulate you, Shanka. It really is a wonderful hat. Absolutely. And I, you know, I a little bit commiserate with those of you, if you're listening in Arizona, Florida, Trinidad, place that's very warm. And you just don't get the chance to wear one. I'm sorry. But... They are one of the perks of living in a place that does get cold. That and very few reptiles and biting insects. And much more of a preserving food culture. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, I mean, we're pretty solidly northern people. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, this is this has been the Ushanka episode of Hatcast. We'll be back next week. If you have any comments to give us about the episode, you can direct them to us at the email address, hatcast at yondex.com. And if you'd like to subscribe for our CD printing service, uh, uh, email we'll, that we'll, address and we'll explain it to you. Yeah, yep, and we'll we'll mail it to you for a small fee. Yeah, h a t c a c h a t c a s t at y a n d e x dot c o m. All right. Well, looking forward to next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.